our way back from a journey around the world on this ship. In the last episode, we visited a place that most people associate with Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, the Galapagos. I looked around here in wonder, and it seemed as if time had stood still. In this episode, the story is about the red continent, Australia. The arid continent, where Darwin saw very little. My great friend Tim Flannery awaited me here. He showed me around this beautiful place, and I saw the consequences that severe drought, enormous heat, and many plagues were having on Australia. But survival is something they're good at in Australia. The adaptability of man is put to the test in this empty continent. In September 2009, I left Plymouth in England to embark on a great adventure. I was invited to set sail with the clipper Stadt Amsterdam and make the same journey that the young naturalist Charles Darwin undertook 179 years ago. The Beagle's circumnavigation of the Earth is the most important journey ever made, far more important than man's voyage to the moon. And I will be repeating this journey together with Darwin's great-great-granddaughter, Sarah. It's a chance of several lifetimes. Australia, the dry continent where Charles Darwin found nothing and where he only stayed briefly. How could he have foreseen that exactly here the population would start experimenting with new ways of agriculture unhindered by traditions that they'd left behind in England? The Red Continent is beautiful but shows no mercy. Drought, heat, isolation and diseases put extreme demands on the survival strategies of man and animal. Everyone's adaptability is continually put to the test. How do they survive? January the 12th, 1836. Early in the morning, a light air carried us towards the entrance of Port Jackson. A solitary lighthouse, built of white stone, alone told us that we were near a great and populous city. Having entered the harbour, it appears fine and spacious, with cliff-formed shores of horizontally stratified sandstone. My first feeling was to congratulate myself that I was born an Englishman. Charles Darwin visited Australia in 1839, when it had been a penal colony for barely half a century. This is where England sent her undesirables. My good friend Tim Flannery awaits me. Not only is he a paleontologist, he was Australian of the Year in 2007 and is a best-selling writer. Recently, he was chairman of the Climate Conference in Copenhagen. I've read your new book, Now and Ever. I've read the whole lot. Well, Tim, I don't know, but sailing in here, magnificent as it was, I still felt 
guilty. I mean, presumptuous to feel guilty, but we did about all the people that were sent here in the name of Great Britain to this vast prison. We still feel it today, Redmond. You know, the, the governor of the colony, when this was first set up as a prison, had more power than the King of England. Wow. He had more power than the Parliament. He was an absolute dictator, could decide matters of life and death on the spot because he couldn't send a letter back to England, no. you know, saying, oh, what should I do? Be no. two years before he heard back, you no. know? So it was a strange place, and we still have a sense of that in Australia. Our political system still reflects a little bit of that authoritarian power. In the middle of the 18th century, prisons in England were bulging with thieves, murderers, rapists, and frauds, but also with those who had committed petty offenses, such as stealing bread or a pen. The penalties were harsh. The British searched for a place where they could dump their criminals, and what better place to do so than on the other side of the world in the recently colonized Australia. Housebreaking, bad notes, life. What does bad notes mean? Oh, bad notes, issuing oh, bad no, notes. Oh, forger. Well, yeah. no, forgery, well, what? more seriously, maybe oh. just issuing a forged note, you know, oh. so passing it on, not actually making it. Highway perhaps. robbery, yes. rape, rape. So I think it just, it reeks of misery, the whole place. And when the ships arrived, I think about half of the convicts died. They, uh, you know, the, the people who brought them into the harbour just said how the stink was indescribable. Oh. Now pulling out dying convicts from the holds oh. and these people were just expiring, you know, when they got to shore. So it was pretty horrendous. Most inhabitants of today's Australia are descendants of either criminals or their guards. It was they, with their pioneering mentality, who developed this new continent with incredible speed. Darwin was astonished when he came here that this place had grown so much in, what, 40, 50 years? There was yeah. this city here, you know. Um, but it, I think he was pretty sceptical that it was going to continue. I think he saw the country was very poor. The soils were poor, the climate was variable. When he began by thinking that Australia might be an America in the south, then he thought there would be problems, uh, unable to feed themselves, and problems with water, and that it was problematic. It's all very true, Redmond. Yeah. He's very prophetic. The truth is, all of this development has come at a terrible cost to nature. And a lot of the reason for that was that these convicts and everyone that's come after has never really seen this as home. You know, even my um, parents' generation used to talk about going home, not back to Sandringham in Melbourne, yeah. but going back to London, mm. you know, going back to Britain. And if you don't think that the place you live in is home, you can do terrible things to it. You can be a bit like a, a renter, you know, yes. trashing a place. Climate in Australia has always been on the edge of the bearable. It has always known dry spells, and water has always been short here. But over the last 10 years, Australia has been struck by lasting drought. Lakes are drying up and forming reservoirs of dust. Climate scientists are trying to determine what the causes and the consequences are of all this dust formation. I did my PhD back in the, the mid to late 1970s, and that was really before climate change was an issue. I've lived in Australia since 1982, um, and I think that in particular in the last uh, 10 years I've noticed substantial changes in the climate, particularly across southern Australia, uh, where things have become remarkably dry. These lakes that are behind us are something of the canary in the coal mine because these lakes have water in them for the last century. The last time they didn't have water in them was, uh, was more than 100 years ago. And um, in the last 10 years, they've dried out. 
And what it really reflects is what a lot of th scientists believe is a, a climate shift. Uh, and it's a shift where the uh, rain-bearing systems that normally bring rain to the southern part of Australia are now actually tracking quite a long way further south. So there's a bit of a, bit of a controversy about whether the, the dramatic drop-off in rainfall is a uh, result of climate change or if it's part of, of a longer term cycle. Nigel puts up a balloon that measures the condition of the wind in order to determine where all the whirling dust coming from the soil at the bottom of the lake is going and measuring how high it travels. The direction the dust takes in the atmosphere is important to predict future weather patterns. Dust may be a nuisance for the farmer who lives along the rim of the lake, but it also has positive aspects. We want to see if the, uh, the Australian continent is a good source of nutrients to the Southern Ocean. In this case, this is a positive outcome in the sense that dust has a positive impact on the oceans and on the climate. These nutrients would feed uh, phytoplankton, which in their growth would trap CO2 and therefore remove CO2 from the atmosphere, which we have too much of. So that's a positive impact. It has, it's a cooling factor on the atmosphere. Drought not only causes dust, it's also the reason for drinking water shortages. Of the 22 million inhabitants of Australia, 4 million live in Sydney. This metropolis is almost completely dependent on one huge dam for its water supply. That's impressive. Yeah, well, it's a huge dam, really. Yes, this goes can... back for miles and miles and miles. Wow. It's absolutely massive and it's Sydney's main water supply. So the whole city of four million people are totally dependent upon this. Just on this? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, when they started building this in 1948, they thought that this would provide water forever. You know? yeah. But since then, the climate's changed and uh, the rainfall's become less reliable. So you can see the brown mark there along the dam wall? Oh, yes. That's should, where it's up to when it's all, full. It should be up, and this should all be covered. Of yeah, of course, yeah. But yeah, I don't think we'll see that again. No, you know, perhaps in a yeah. freakish year, but the, 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 the trend in terms of just less and less water every year is such that uh, we're just surviving between bare adequacy and crisis now, you know, yeah. as we go on. But what exactly is well, your problem with this dam looks... Well, look, it's, it's partly that it's all of the catchment is off a bit inland. Ah. And over the last few decades, the rainfall's been retreating southwards and retreating to the coast. So we just don't get as much rain over the catchment as we used to. And so the water level just keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. Ah. You know, and with the odd boost when we get a bit of rain, but the trend is clear, you know, it's downwards. So that's one big problem with it. And the second one is just that philosophy of having all of your eggs in one basket, one super dam. It seems to me it's the wrong model for Australia. In the whole country, I scarcely saw a place without the marks of a fire. Whether these had been more or less recent, whether the stumps were more or less black, was the greatest change which varied the uniformity, so wearisome to the traveller's eye. Clouds of dust were travelling in every direction, and the wind felt as if it had passed over a fire. I afterwards heard that the thermometer out of doors had stood at 119 degrees, and in a closed room at 96. Bushfires in Australia go hand in hand. The indigenous inhabitants of Australia, the Aboriginals, made good use of the bushfires to enable them to hunt. But the catastrophic bushfires that Australia endured during the last decade have been so extreme that they are thought to be a product of climate change induced by humans. In 2009, the town of Kinglake was struck by a bushfire that killed 132 people. During this inferno, 
temperatures were measured of more than 1,400 degrees Celsius. Winds reached speeds as fast as 200 kilometers an hour. Sarah listens to the heartbreaking stories of the survivors. Well, the people were on the road. It was cars smashed, burning, fallen trees over an old couple's car. Um, there was panic. There was panic everywhere. Yeah. The, you, know, you couldn't travel on the main roads. There was trees coming down everywhere, yeah. power lines, etc. Uh, and we're going to move up here permanently when the house is being built. Yeah, because you want to keep an eye. Oh, I see. This wow, and this was all right. This survived. People who thought they were prepared, yeah. uh, and any normal fire that came through, they would have been fine. Um, right. It's just that this one was, was bigger than anyone could have expected. Yeah. I mean, all of a sudden, this huge fireball, like something out of a medieval attack on a castle, came flying through the sky, flew through the sky, and, and uh, landed in the paddock we're in, right on a big pile of wood we're going to burn. At some stage, was there for it. And the whole place blew up. And that was it. And then went black. And black and orange and black and red. And it was just, everyone just said, go. And by the time it come through some burning trees and got back here, um, the place was black and the whole of King Lake was blasting in, in horizontal flames. So the wind would have been 100k or so. And, and uh, the gas bottles were exploding. Uh, people were running and screaming everywhere. And houses were blow blowing up. There was no fire front, it was just a storm. It was like a hurricane with fire. and stones you can put back together but you can't get the people back. You can't and that was the worst thing I think. And uh, there was too much of that. Uh, not the sort of thing not the sort of thing I expect to see again in my life. take you today, Redmond, to see the most fantastic character. Yeah. He's a mate of mine who's a farmer and he's invented a new way of ploughing in Australia using a solar plough, using sunlight. A farmer who's invented something. That's right. I know it sounds strange, right. but... It's a very strange country. It goes against all common sense and common practice. <laughs> Together with Tim, I'm on my way to visit an Australian farmer. He doesn't plough his land any longer but rather cuts narrow notches in the ground in which seeds and fertilizers can easily be inserted. But you used to do conventional ploughing here, did you? Absolutely. And yeah. uh, this is, it's a, it is a logical progression, even though it seems like quite a strange one. Yes. Um, this is just a much, much more efficient way. Uh, when we're not buying diesel, we can utilise uh, the sun's power to, to drive the vehicle. I think there are some technical aspects there that need to be developed more, but that the concept of Pasture cropping and no-kill cropping are really efficient, particularly when you get climate variability. You reduce the risks. Uh, you can get, get a result, get a harvestable crop, but uh, your fallback position is that you've still got your grazing um, grasses underneath. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> ah, it's extraordinary. So that's uh, about that's the sort a... of noise level that people might have been used to in the country when they used horses and yes. yeah. the like. Yeah, that's a wonderful thought. It's amazing. Very difficult to 
plan against the problems of a drought when you when you it's reoccurring. All your storages, your grain storages and hay storages, they're used up in one drought. You don't have time or you have a, a, a harvest that is a failure, so you don't have the storage for the next drought. That that's the hardest part of the recent drought. And that's in opposition, you know, to to when um you first started farming where the seasons were good and a drought was a rare occurrence. Yeah. It was always time to prepare for drought because you had seven good seasons and maybe two that were so-so and one one bad drought, perhaps every ten years. Probably in terms of, of a year, and, and I can recall 1957 was a bad drought, but we seemed to be into it, into 1957, then out of it again in 1965. That was a severe drought, but we're in it, out of it, and back to normal. Good harvest, storage, but now it's it's been a series of years and never quite getting out of it before you get to the next one. This drought, this last 10 years, has tested everyone, everyone's ability to to survive uh, and manage through it. And uh, I don't I don't believe there are many people who operate the same way they did 10 years ago. Meanwhile, Sarah has travelled inland in search of the effects that the extreme droughts are having on Australia. Besides the fact that they bring much misery, there's also something positive worth noticing in nature. After the fires, this area um, was totally black, black and there was no colour left here whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a smoke haze right through the, the area. The smoke haze lasted for uh, for, for months. We had black dust getting into everything yeah. um, and then the forest started to regenerate. The green started coming back, the tree ferns started growing and then a lot of um, the lichen and moss came up as well after the first rains. Uh, funnily enough, a lot of the ones that started coming back earlier were the introduced pasture grasses. Really? Uh, and you can see a lot of the, the trees, some have died, but you can see some of the eucalypts have sprouting uh, leaves yep. um, so they can photosynthesize on that um, to get s some food back into the, the tree. Mm -hmm. uh, these are survival leaves and they'll fall off eventually as the tree starts to grow. Uh, another thing the trees have done too is drop millions and millions of seeds and right. you can see along the, on the ground a lot of the eucalypts are starting to, so to grow now. New growth. This is all new growth, all right. these eucalypts here. Yeah. Uh, the grass is coming up again because there was seeds around for the grass that's coming up. Uh, so it's all regrowing. This is so spectacular, isn't it? Yes. The way you see these new growth croziers just coming out, unfurling. Yes, oh, they're, they're marvellous. Absolutely they're marvellous. spectacular. Tim and I are about to have to say goodbye but there's still one place he wants to take me. The, the only bad thing about I it is to show you this. any minute the whole lot's going to burn. And, That's true, but and it's... It, and it, it really brought it home to me when you said your great library in Sydney had just burnt outside yes. Sydney. That's creative destruction. Right. But not of books. <laughs> no, books. not of books. Not of books. books. I mean, no. one doesn't forget them. But the fire here is, is, is creative destruction. And, and this country, this is the real Australia. It's not that crap by the coast. It's not yeah. the... Opera House or anything else. This is the real, real pain. Yeah. Well, it does feel like it. Really is. These things, they're seed pods, and they'll sit on this plant for 10 years if they need, or 20 years until a fire comes by. And then they open up and they release just two seeds, fall to the ground in the ash after the fire, and a new one comes up. So that's waiting for a fire, too. This is everything here is waiting, that's for, a waiting fire. for a fire. As Europeans coming to live in this country, we've never really understood it and we've never tried to understand it. And it worried me too, you look at the trees here, they're so thin and all have those leaves that hang down. They're not like European trees. But why is it? You know? And it took me about 10 years to think about this from every angle I could till I realised it actually is all about the soils here. This is a continent of very ancient and poor soils. 
and even more than its variable climate and everything else, it's the soil here that dictates conditions of life. The thing that worries me about it is how sustainable all of that is, you know, because this place has been used as a quarry and a farm, and a very badly managed farm at that. You know, yeah. it's lost a lot of its a lot of its topsoils. And you Europeans, what you respond to really is this space. Yes. And you never ask why the space is there. No, never. No, the space is there because the country isn't always like this. No. Where we sit now, you can have a decade-long drought with hardly any no. water, no. and then you'll get a bushfire with such ferocity, Redmond, it'll just come across that hill and wipe out everything behind us. It's a savage land, and it's not a very uh, welcoming land when you get down to the basics, you know, get down to the soil and everything else. We have to listen to the country and learn what it's got to tell us. This is our home now and will be my children's home and their children's home forever. We actually have to become true Australians, you know, in a way we're not now. We're Europeans squatting on the land. Anyway, Redmond, cheers. Yeah, well here's to this great country of yours. Yes, good. Yes. <laughs> We sail further on our way to Melbourne. We want to look for Australian animals that have adapted to the barren landscapes. There are invasive species that have often been imported from other parts of the world. By bitter experience, Australians have now become extremely anxious about the introduction of exotic animals and plants. That's why our ship was thoroughly inspected upon our arrival in Australian waters. Every ship um, over 25 metres must be inspected. Right. This is just scraped off the hull. One of our team will find out if it's going to be invasive or not. Charles Darwin already understood that this isolated continent has great difficulty in absorbing new species. A few years since, this country abounded with wild animals, but now the emu is banished to a long distance and the kangaroo has become scarce. To both, the English greyhound has been highly destructive. It may be long before these animals are altogether exterminated, but their doom is fixed. Luckily, the clipper is clean, but the Australians' fear of foreign species is understandable, as Australia has a painful history of disastrous introductions. Our ship's biologist, Dirick, is meeting up with Professor Shine, who used to be a passionate expert on snakes, but was forced to expand his expertise to toads. The cane growers brought in the toads, they brought in 101 toads, they bred them up carefully, began releasing them, and uh, the rest is history. Uh, they didn't control the beetles, but they loved Australia, and they have now spread across about one and a half million square kilometres of tropical and subtropical Australia. Okay, so this is a, a female cane toad. Toads have chemical poisons that they use to kill predators that attack them. So our Australian predators, like the big lizards and the snakes and some of the marsupials and the crocodiles, they see a toad, they think it's just a nice big frog, they grab it, and they're dead of a heart attack within a minute or two. 
And of course, if you remove top predators from a tropical ecosystem, that's going to have all kinds of flow on effects. These are important animals. So yes, toads are a problem. They really are a major ecological issue in Australia. So this is a very poisonous toad, but still you grab it like that? They're incredibly reluctant to actually use the toxin. I mean, there's a, there's a huge amount of poison in, in these glands, but the toad just doesn't seem to want to use it. And unless a predator actually grabs and, and, and the teeth sink into the gland, then the, the venom just stays within there and the yeah. animal's completely harmless. The difficulty is that if you got a month of dry weather, you might kill a million toads, and if you got one wet night and a single female toad produces 30,000 eggs in one clutch, your population size around that pond just went, went from two to 30,002. In order to control the toad problem, several initiatives have been started. We just got those out because we noticed a lot of people around were actually swerving to hit the toads on the road. How to hit them? Yeah. yeah, to hit them, to run yeah. them over. So we just brought those out just as a bit of a fun, okay. fun thing to do. <laughs> In a hot, stinking shed. Is, is this all toad killing business or? But yeah, you've got all of our, all of our traps and most of our equipment down here and the most we've ever caught in one of these was 232 what? toads. And you opened you opened the trap and there was just a big a big cube of toads just all stacked up on top of each other. It was awesome. We're a very very wildlife based community. I mean we we love our our wildlife so basically the more we can do about this the better and we are finding that just doing what we're doing has made an impact on the number of toads around. If you really get, if you really get, if you really get good, you can start doubling them up. So you'll have eight per hand. <laughs> I'll show, I'll, I, I deal with sure. one at a time. I'll try. I'll try and show you that trick tonight. Depends how many toads we get. But no, I did that one night. And I had, had eight, eight toads. What we're going to be doing tonight is just doing a bit of a walk around this grass area out here. Um, yeah, just any toad we find, pick it up. If you're not sure if it's a toad or not, call me. I'll come and give you a hand. So yeah, what we'll do is, because we've got a few, a few people tonight, what I might do is split you guys down the middle, break into two groups. Each group will have three spotlights per group. This is the end for him, unfortunately. That's a female, and that's a male. And they too. They die together. They die together indeed. Good size on that one. Toad. Yeah. 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 Uh, these ones are going to be taken back to um, to our freezer and frozen, and then for, and then further on down the track they'll be taken out to Howard Springs and turned into fertilizer. We um we've got a fertilizer brand called Toad Juice. Toad Juice. <laughs> virtually, virtually just liquefied cane toads. Basically, what it is is just put cane toads into a big vat, put a chemical over them which liquefies them, and then once that's done, you just start pouring all the liquid into into little bottles. And at the end, what you're left with is real flimsy bones. It seems like a lost battle. Man's effort to eradicate the toads. Isn't nature capable of solving the problem by itself? now is we're just slowing down because we are in the territory of a five and a half metre male crocodile. We just wanted to stop here because we know the big boy likes to hang out in this little creek. Now folks, just uh, do not stick your heads out. Always remember that when you're in the territory, all <laughs> crocodiles are hungry. Skinny. 
Come on. Good girl. Oh, nearly. <laughs> In Kakadu, there is a dwarf crocodile in Kakadu, and the cane toad um, did a massive destruction on them in Kakadu. So, because uh, that, uh, something new, the crocodiles just see it as food and uh, eat it. We did see a large uh, reduction in our babies. So these babies that we got to see today, this is the first year that we've been able to find babies on the river for the, in the last three years. How cute are they? Super cute. And here in the territory, you can actually have them as pets at this size, and you get to keep them until they're around. What we're seeing is the Australian system adapting to toads. We've done quite a bit of work on one of the snakes and we've shown that there is very rapid evolution of their behaviour. The ones in places where toads occur no longer eat toads. Their physiology, those snakes can tolerate the toxin of the toad much better than snakes of the same species from other areas. And even their ability to eat a large enough toad to kill them has been reduced by the evolution of a smaller head size compared to body size. So the snakes, the predators that are most at risk, are already showing evolutionary responses that are making them much better capable of surviving and coexisting with these sort of nasty pests. So it's not all doom and gloom. Mother Nature is resilient. We are seeing long-term changes that help the fauna survive. Our challenge, I think, as ecologists, is to make it a little bit easier for that system to work. You know, as Charles Darwin said, it's as if there were two creators at work, one of them in Australia and one of them in the rest of the world. So as an Australian biologist, it's fantastic. We've got all these wonderful creatures that nobody else has got. On the other hand, it means that there are so many types of animals on the rest of the planet that don't belong here that have been brought here and that cause great problems. So the invasive species problem we have in Australia, which is huge, really is just a reflection of how distinctive our own plants and animals are. A dingo fence has run straight through Australia for more than 100 years. It has admittedly made sure that the dingoes, Australia's wild dogs, don't come near the sheep anymore. But at the same time, it has created a new problem. Without their natural predator, kangaroos and rabbits are out of control. There seems to be a drawback to every effort to interfere with natural processes, every toolbox for survival. But here in the animal shelter, they find it important to give nature a helping hand. We have um, kangaroos where the mother's uh, found killed on the highway. Somebody travelling down the road will find the dead mother and um, uh, rescue the little joey out of the pouch. Oops, hang on. Yeah, kangaroos have two sets of ears, one in their head and one in their feet. So There's a very small hole and if you have a look down close, and we think it's because um, back many hundreds of thousands of years ago, they may have had a predator. Big red kangaroos today do not have any predators other than human. And, um, but we believe there was a carnivorous kangaroo that um, grew to about three metres tall many hundreds of thousands of years ago. And possibly it was one of the predators of the big red. So we believe the second set of ears in their feet was to hear their predators coming. <laughs> no. no, baby, you're too big. You're too big now. As they grow, about 10 to 12 months they become aggressive, they start to become afraid of sounds and people and then about 14 to 16 months of age they start to become aggressive. If you have a look at these paws, the hands, you can see they're pretty, pretty big scratching out implements already. Um, but as they get older, eventually they, can, they start scratching, they can shred a person, their clothing, um, they can box, they'll bo and the punches, even at this age, if he threw a punch now, would be pretty strong and you'd feel it. Uh, they learn to kick very early and that's what they do. This one, if she kicked you now, it would knock you over. You now, when this little one's fully grown, he'd be more than capable of killing a man. The question remains whether they will be able to adapt enough to survive in the ruthless nature of Australia.
if, if you prepare them correctly, so you have a window of opportunity around about 14 to 16 months of age where you can dehumanise and rehabilitate them back in the wild. So it's just a really a withdrawal of human contact. Survival is a battle in Australia, not only for animals. With varying success, humans have tried to turn nature to their advantage. But there are places in the world where you have no other choice than just to abide by the circumstances as in the opal mining town of Cooper Pedy, deep in the Australian desert. Because of the high temperatures, they built their houses underground. That's uh, my dugout home, more out of necessity than, uh, than choice really, I suppose. And during the summer months when the temperature up here can get up to 45, 44, 40, 45 degrees, um, it's still a constant 24 to 26 degrees inside the dugout. Um, it gives you that constant temperature during the summer months. In the w winter months when the nighttime temperature can drop down to zero and below zero, it's still 24, 25 degrees underground. The sandstone being self-supporting, very strong, it holds the heat and the temperature. It stays constant all the time underground. It's, it's beautiful. You do as much work as you can in the early hours of the morning, the evenings, and sleep through the hottest part of the day. Grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. How far can humans adjust to their natural circumstances? If we believe the climatologists, we should all be prepared to live with temperatures like those found in Cuba Pedi as the earth heats up. Ever since we evolved intelligence, we've tried so many times to improve the Earth for ourselves. And most attempts have led to disaster. So it's hardly surprising that in a discussion here on the ship about proposals to save the Earth, passions ran very, very high. Some, like the American entrepreneur Russ George, want to take controversial steps to do so. Not on land, but to our surprise, on the ocean. Well, we're going to help to try to save the world by uh, restoring the health of the oceans. That's our primary purpose. The basic premise of my two guests is to transfer dust from land to sea. Ah, this is super natuurlijk. We kijk, je ziet het stof helemaal gaan daar. We kijk, het is allemaal stof wat zo hier over de zee wordt uitgeblazen. The dust clouds are very important for supplying nutrients to the oceans because they contain iron. More iron means more algae, more plankton, and eventually more fish. No less important is the fact that algae can absorb enormous amounts of CO2, which means it takes the gas that causes the greenhouse effect out of the atmosphere. Kijk eens even, zie je dat? Beetje rode verkleuring. Nou, dat is typisch Australisch stof. Russ George thinks that if dust is good for the ocean, we should add it to the ocean ourselves. Well, it's really remarkably simple. Everywhere on Earth where you see dirt on land, where the dirt, it, dirt's either kind of tan and colored or it's red colored. Well, where it's red colored, that means it has iron oxides in it, right? Which is iron ore. And if we take that and we grind it into a very, very fine dust, even finer than what Mother Nature can grind it, and we sprinkle it in the ocean, remarkably small quantities of it will cause the ocean to bloom again and bring it back to health. It's something we can do tomorrow. 
you know, one handful of iron ore will bring will, will grow me one million handful sized fish. I think Russ George is an enemy to environmentalists and scientists alike because he wants to start experimenting by throwing large amounts of iron in the ocean, while very little is known about the possible consequences such action might have. We believe this is the best drug ever invented in, in academic science and that it, well, it is the single cure for the thing that ails this planet the most and it's time to deliver the drug. IJzer is belangrijk en uh, IJzer is zit in stof. Alleen ja, dat is maar 5% uh, van het materiaal. En die andere 95% willen ook graag weten wat het is en wat het doet als je het in zee mikt. Dus uh, dat, dat is uh, het doel van deze, van deze uh, expeditie. Er zijn zoveel evenwichten in de oceaan die we kunnen verstoren. En als je dat maar op groot genoeg, uh, als je de schaal waarop je die verstoring aanbrengt, maar groot genoeg is, dan kan het inderdaad gevaarlijk zijn. In the ocean, we're not sure about the effects. Sure, we are. We're, we're absolutely sure about. There's a bloom. No, no, we're absolutely certain about the effects in, in all of the history of ocean. What's then the difference between those near shore conditions and the one uh, near the Canary Islands that's also near shore? How, how can you how can you discern this? It's two. I am the single man on the planet Earth who has proposed and attempted to do this in a commercial environment instead of an academic environment. So, it we looks as if the gentleman cannot agree. And the question remains whether we should just go ahead and experiment like that. Has Australian history not proved to us before that we can't just interfere with nature unpunished? With the discussion between the entrepreneur Russ George and the scientist Jan Badenstut, we've reached the field of geoengineering intervening with natural processes on a large scale. At the University of Sydney, Professor Ian Jones is studying the fertilization of the ocean with nitrogen. He claims that not only could nitrogen solve our CO2 problem, it could also solve the problem of hunger in the world. We add this nutrient from a floating vessel like a ship, and we add um, that over each day, it'll drift away in the, in the current, and after seven days, there'll be a patch of phytoplankton, a kind of a circular patch. And we imagine that, uh, that sardines will graze on that. And it has two advantages. A, they'll be fattened, so we're fattening the sardines. But secondly, fishing will be easier because they'll be concentrated around this food source. So if you have one station, you might take up 10 million tons of carbon dioxide per year. That's the sign of size we think of. That would make a million tons of fish. And remember, we only catch 90 million tons of fish all in the whole world. So one station can bring 1% of the fish catch in. And how large is one station? One station needs about 25 kilometers by 25 kilometers yeah. region that's enriched. Yeah. And how much proportion of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is, is it being hauled up done by such a station? Well, it takes up 10 million tons a year. That's about the same amount as one power station puts out. We can change the world with a simple idea. Uh, and we just have to have that simple idea understood by many people. Sid French arrives. He's an engineer and a colleague of Ian Jones. The fact that French is an engineer already implies that these men are aiming for the development of a practical application and a profit. Basically, you, you start a, a food chain and you end up with uh, fish that are big enough to catch and eat. The, the thing that we absolutely don't want to do is make a bad mistake. We don't want something that will, if you like, uh, uh, you know, nuclear sense become a chain reaction that goes out of control. So a lot of the work is to make sure that what we're doing is conservative. And we, we now know what limits that we can work within uh, to make sure these things don't happen. I still can't believe that you will actually control all possible changes. Sir. Once you change the ecosystem, you'll have to manage it forever. There's no hope that we can make one single change and form a new equilibrium. That's a myth. To say do nothing would be to, if you like, let the, the whole thing go, be, go from bad to worse, and we want to avoid that.
I think we're going to have to manage nature. Humans have affected the planet so massively that in essence all we have less is zoos of various kinds. It would be lovely to think that we could just lock the gate and walk away and Mother Nature would take care of herself. But the cane toads are going to move under that gate, the invasive weeds are going to establish. There are so many processes that we've set in train that the small isolated fragments of natural systems that we have left simply cannot deal with them. I think we have an ethical responsibility to do something about the problems that we've created. I think we have to do it very carefully. There's a long history of disaster. It's clear that Mother Nature is complicated. It's clear that she's resilient. We have to go in there, I think, in carefully and sensitive ways, in ways that won't, you know, destabilise those systems and take advantage of the, the strengths that that natural system has got to help it repair itself. There is no higher authority. We must make our own toolbox for survival. On the small scale, with genetics. And, equally important, on the very, very large scale, seeding the oceans with iron or nitrogen, changing the atmosphere of the Earth. Given that we messed nature up in the first place, the only hope is to keep on going. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you liked it. If so, you can watch the next episode here. Or check another recommended series on our channel. And don't forget to subscribe to get updates on new series.